The first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions on health and wellbeing. Question number one, Hugh Henry has not been lodged and an explanation has been provided. Question number two, Jim Hume. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how it will use technology to improve access to primary health care services. Cabinet Secretary Alex Neil. Presiding officer, we've made considerable investment in electronic primary care systems over the last 10 years, including developing two electronic GP record systems, systems to share emergency care information, systems which allow community health workers to access information on the move, telehealth and telecare systems, and an e-pharmacy programme. The next step is to build on this good foundation to improve interoperability between systems and to develop those components that are still missing to create a future integrated primary care ecosystem that is linked to acute services. The GPIT framework contract is due for re-procurement in 2017 and this will offer the opportunity to review systems and applications and define future requirements to inform the procurement process. We have an e-health strategy which identifies investment priorities, including those for primary care. It is being refreshed to reflect progress and technological advances. Thank you, Jim Hume. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. The Cabinet Secretary should be aware of the work the Borders Deaf and the Hard of Hearing Network is doing with NHS Borders on using SMS texting for deaf and hard of hearing patients in terms of making and cancelling appointments for doctors or dentists. It's a credit to Jim Proudfoot and our team at the Borders Deaf and Hard of Hearing Network in Gala Shields that pilot scheme has now been initiated in the Borders so that hearing impaired people can easily make change and cancel audiology patients using mobile texts. And would the Cabinet Secretary join me in congratulating Jean Proudfoot and her team for progressing this project? And will the Cabinet Secretary commend this pilot to other health board areas to ensure that all deaf and hard of hearing patients across Scotland can benefit from modest but effective steps in looking, for vulner looking after vulnerable Cabinet patients? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, I'm always delighted to help members with their local press releases, and I'm therefore delighted to uh, <laughs> endorse everything that Mr Hume said and ensure that he doesn't need to amend the release. Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary to have officials enter into discussions with RNIB Scotland and Optometry Scotland regarding the positive health uses that tablets and their inbuilt software can actually bring to people who are visually impaired? Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, absolutely. It's another very good example of the importance now of new technology that's coming through. And let me say one of the areas where there's most new developments is in the use of apps. And we now have a lot of apps uh, helping a lot of different types of application right across the health spectrum. And Stuart McMillan, along with the Jim Hume, have highlighted a number of these today, presiding officer. I'm attaching very high priority to working with the industry, the innovators, as well as with patients uh, and doctors and nurses to spread the use of these new technologies as quickly as possible because they can do enormous work in improving the life the standard of life of all those affected by blindness and other ailments. Thank you. Question number three, Gavin Brown. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what the priorities are for the health budget in 2015-16. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, the 2020 Vision for Health and Social Care sets out the vision of the Scottish Government that by 2020 everyone is able to live longer, healthier lives at home or in a homely setting. The 2020 vision provides a focus for the priorities for the health budget in 2015-16 with three central aims. One, improving the quality of care we provide. Two, improving the health of the population. Three, securing the value and financial sustainability of health and social care services. Gavin Brown. I'm grateful for that answer. Is the 2015-16 health and wellbeing budget lower in real terms than both 2012-13 and 2013-14. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Presenting officer, as a member will know, not only have we passed on every penny that's been passed on to us for revenue spending in the health service, but when Mr Swinney announced his budget a few weeks ago, we announced that on top of doing that, for next year, we're putting an extra £80 million into the health budget. And if you look at the capital side, Despite the massive cuts made by Westminster in our capital budget overall for the Scottish Government of 25%, 
the notional value of the NPD and hub projects, the notional value on an annualised basis for next year is over £300 million. So by any stretch of the imagination, given the very, very tight budget that we're working to, we are devoting every penny available to our National Health Service. Thank you. Aileen McLeod. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary how much additional funding the Scottish Government would have for the health budget spending priorities in 2015-16 had the UK Government not renegade on the 1% pay deal for NHS staff in England? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, had the Treasury allocated additional funding to the Department of Health to support the 1% pay deal, which of course they didn't implement south of the border, we estimate there would have been additional spend of £300 million in England. The Barnet consequentials for health in Scotland would have been just under £30 million, which would have been a substantial additional contribution to improving health care in Scotland next year. Thank you. Question number four, Anne McTaggart. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to promote the benefits of organ donation. Minister Michael Matheson. Scotland is the only UK country to have consistently run annual high-profile media and advertising campaigns promoting organ donation and transplantation. I launched this year's campaign on the 27th of October, and this will run until January next year. Our annual campaigns are the reason why 41% of the Scottish population is now on the NHS organ donor register, compared to 32% in the rest of the UK. Additionally, on Monday this week, the Scottish Government published the first, annual, the first national report card on organ donation. This is the first time anywhere in the UK the NHS performance in this area has been made available in this way. This year's report card reflects very good progress, with Scotland having achieved almost a 100% increase in organ donations and a 62% increase in transplants since 2007. We have also seen a 25% reduction in the transplant waiting list since 2006. Anne McTaggart. Thanks, President Officer, and thank the Minister for the outstanding work that the Scottish Government have been providing. However, in light of the fact that for every one organ donor, seven lives can be saved, and that last year 38 people died waiting for organs in Scotland alone, Will the Scottish Government back the introduction of a sought-out system for organ donation to increase the number of available organs like the Welsh Government have, leading the way with Northern Ireland and England, promoting such law also to save many more lives than present? Minister. Well, it is worth keeping in mind that the uh, part of the UK which has got the highest level of organ donations taking place per head of its population is in Scotland. And I think it would be... Uh, we need to be very careful that we don't think that the answer to addressing uh, the, increasing need, the need for increasing numbers of organs can be addressed by an opt-out system, because there are countries that already have an opt-out system that already have a very low level of donation level. Uh, so it's not the solution in itself. But we are guided in these matters by the Scottish Transplant Group, and the Scottish Transplant Group is made up of clinical experts, those who are uh, donor recipients and their families and carers. And at this point, their view is that, in their opinion, an opt-out system is not appropriate. But what we need to do is to continue to build on the very good progress we've made here in Scotland by the infrastructure changes which we've made, which have delivered these record numbers of organ donations taking place in Scotland. And our intention in our new, transplant pl our new plan for transplantation is to make sure we continue to drive that forward in the future years. Nanette Mill. Thank you. The Minister has told us of recent uh, increases in the uh, number of organ donors. Uh, is this um, a part of uh, the impact of the Human Tissue Bill, which was approved in this Parliament back uh, eight years ago? And how does Scotland now compare with countries like Spain and Holland, which I believe have had a soft opt-out system for a number of years now? Minister. Um, the reason that we've actually made significant progress, and this is not due to legislation, but because of the infrastructure changes which we've made, for example, in having uh, transplant nurses based in particular units, because, of course, 
organs can only be received from a recipient, uh, from an individual donor, in particular circumstances, in particular within our uh, accident and uh, intensive care uh, units. So there are very, very specific measures we've taken in order to increase the number of organs that we can achieve from these particular environments. It is worth keeping in mind that it was back in, I think, 1979 that the Spanish introduced a soft uh, opt-out system but it was over 10 years before they actually gained any increase in organ donation. And the reason for that is because they hadn't made infrastructure changes which were necessary. But America has a consistently higher level of donor uh, organs than any other part of Europe, but they don't have an opt-out system. The reason they have a high level is because of their infrastructure development. So we have to be very careful in considering this matter. There is no single thing that will address this issue to make sure we get more organs donated. But what we have been able to demonstrate over the last five years, by the work that we've taken forward as a government, we now have record numbers of organs being donated and a record number of transplantations taking place. What we are determined to do is to make sure we build on that progress and that we continue to make sure that Scotland leads the rest of the UK in this area. Thank you. Question number five, Margaret McCulloch. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the recent Healthcare Environment Inspectorate report on Herr Myers Hospital. Cabinet Secretary Alex Neil. Presiding officer, reducing healthcare associated infections in Scotland is a key priority for the Scottish Government. This inspection report revealed unacceptable standards in Hare Myers Hospital, and I have been clear that NHS Lanarkshire must address the issues highlighted as a matter of priority. I know that the Board is taking this report very seriously and has drawn up an action plan which details how it intends to resolve the issues and prevent them from happening again. As a support team led by Health Protection Scotland is working with the Health Board to help it rectify the issues raised in this report. The Healthcare Environment Inspectorate will con continue to inspect the hospital to ensure lessons identified are being taken forward and that the cleanliness, quality and safety of services is maintained at all times. It is extremely important that patients and the public continue to have confidence in the cleanliness of Scottish hospitals and the quality of NHS Scotland services. And that is why we have introduced these inspections as one of a range of measures to tackle healthcare associated infections. Margaret McCulloch. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that, report, for that reply. But people were actually shocked at the reports of blood and bodily fluids contaminating trolleys, scales, beds and handrails. Feces were on the walls and dirt in the shower floors. And there was a build-up of dust in a ward that was supposed to have just been deep cleaned. This is unprecedented and unacceptable deterioration in standards at Hermia Hospital. Why have the standards declined so much under this government? And do you believe there is a connection with the findings of last year's HIST report on NHS Lanarkshire? And does this not Can along, confirm please? that the report that Hare Myers Hospital and the NHS in Lanarkshire are actually reaching breaking points? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, if I can gently just say to the member, Hare Myers Hospital is a PFI contracted hospital. Yes. And one of the great tragedies from the previous administration is that £50 million of NHS Lanarkshire's budget every year is spent on PFI charges. It equates to 25% of all the PFI charges Order, please, right across the cabinet section. Scotland. And therefore, uh, to, to try to blame this on the Scottish Government, with all due respect, is absurd. The reason why this happened is because the people did not carry out their duties. And as I've said, and I agree with you, it is totally unacceptable. But let me tell the member this, that I am instructing my officials to carry out an issue a tender for a deep dive review of the PFI contract at Hare Myers, because I am not satisfied that it's providing best value for money for the Scottish taxpayer. Thank you, Jim Hume. Yes. Thank you. Can the Cabinet Secretary explain a little bit better why these significant hygiene feelings at Hare Myers were allowed to get to this state? And would you agree with me that it's simply a case of taking the eye off the ball on key issues like our hospital hygiene whilst busy referendum campaigning? Cabinet Secretary. Presenting officer, to the best of my knowledge, none of the cleaners in the Hare Myers were involved in the referendum campaign. <laughs> 
Uh, and therefore, I don't think the link between the referendum campaign and the standard of cleanliness is a very strong one. Uh, uh, can, I, can I just say that I absolutely accept that the failures in cleanliness are totally unacceptable, but under the previous administration, we didn't have these inspections. They didn't inspect. They didn't check. What we are doing is we have been open, transparent, and we are managing the situation on an ongoing basis, which is why these things are now flagged up, which previously were never reported. Richard Simpson. Cabinet Secretary, it's clearly welcome that there is an inspection system, though I have to say I called for it two years before you actually introduced it. They, and it was introduced in England two years earlier. But you've made a great play in, in, in uh, being Cabinet Secretary in the role of the non-execs and having them walk around and make sure that things happened. So how do you feel about the situation where there's an unannounced report, a discussion with the board about the problem, and then a further follow-up report which showed that a ward which was supposedly deep cleaned had not been deep cleaned? Where were these non-execs in dealing with this, because that is the bit of this that is even more unacceptable, that it is not actually being taken seriously by boards, because our inspection system can only report to you, and I appreciate you're trying to deal with it, but they do not have the teeth to actually go in and enforce the sort of cleaning that we all want to see. Cabinet Secretary. Can I, can I first of all say to the member very gently that he was in a, a minister in the government before this government, and if he was so, if we, at one point you were, and if he was so keen on inspections, why did that administration not introduce them uh, instead of waiting for us to do it? However, like me, he is absolutely right in saying that this inspection regime is the right thing to do, and very clearly there has been a real failure to keep Hayer Myers clean. That's a failure in management at Hayer Myers. And also, I expect the board of NHS Lanarkshire, like any health board, uh, to take a very active interest in establishing why it happened, why it was allowed to continue, why it wasn't identified, why corrective action wasn't taken much quicker than what it was. And I think the member on all of these questions raises a very valid point, which I have already, through my officials, communicated in no uncertain terms to the board uh, and the senior management team at NHS Lanarkshire. Thank you. Question number six, Jenny Mara. To ask the Scottish Government, in light of the facilities being similar, what the reason is for the difference in the costs of building the Murray Royal, Gart Naval Royal and the new Craig's psychiatric units? Cabinet Secretary. Leading officer, there are substantial differences between the scope and specification of the facilities the member mentions. Gart Naval Royal Hospital was completed in 2007 with an estimated capital cost of £17.7 million. New Craig's Hospital was completed three years later in 2000 with an estimated capital value of £16.5 million. Both have floor area in the region of 9,000 square miles. The Murray... Meters, sorry. Meters. <laughs> Well, I did. Order, please. I did say I was ambitious for the health service. <laughs> the, uh, the, the Murray Royal Hospital, which was completed in 2012 with an estimated capital value of approximately £75 million, is a substantially larger facility with a broader scope of services. Also included at the Murray Royal, unlike the other two facilities mentioned by the member, is a secure care facility. The overall floor area is approximately, and I will say this very carefully, 24,200 square metres. In addition, construction costs vary substantially over time, and there is a difference of 12 years between the earliest completion date and the latest. Thank you, Jenny Mara. 
I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. It's a very interesting answer because there are actually less beds in the Murray Royal Psychiatric Unit than there are in New Craigs, but yet it cost £50 million more to build. I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary might put his auditors or NHS auditors on the case of this um, £50 million increase. And can he also tell me why it was that the Murray Royal dropped £10 to £11 million in value the day it was taken on to NHS Tayside's books. NHS board haven't come up with an answer to this. Maybe the Cabinet Secretary does know the answer. Cabinet Secretary. Can, can I, first of all, just say on the main point the member raises, she will probably have heard of apples and oranges. <laughs> and my advice to her is you should never compare the two and try to draw conclusions. <laughs> to compare the costs associated with the Murray Royal with the other two facilities is nonsensical for the reasons I outline. First of all, in terms of the time difference. Second, in terms of the configuration of the services and the facilities. Thirdly, Murray Royal has got a secure care facility. And therefore, you would expect building something 12 years later would cost more particularly during that period when construction costs generally were rising substantially. And you would expect, if it was a bigger hospital, in terms of the square meterage, and it included a secure care facility, I think even any poor economist would expect there to be a very substantial price difference. Question number seven, Alex Johnston. <laughs> to ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the Scottish Medicines Consortium decision not to make the drugs Cadcilla and Pergetta available for breast cancer patients in the light of these being available in England under the Cancer Drugs Fund. Cabinet Secretary. Presenting officer, the Scottish Medicines Consortium make decisions independently of ministers. The SMC decisions in these drugs are disappointing for many, and like many patient groups, I would encourage the manufacturer of these drugs to make, avail make them available at a lower cost to enable more people to have them as a treatment option in future. NHS England announced last week that these drugs are included in those being reviewed in England in order to reduce the products and indications within the Cancer Drugs Fund to bring their projected spend within budget. Alec Johnson. I thank the Minister for his answer, and he and I are both aware that in many cases these drugs have the potential to prolong life, perhaps even for a short time, with those who have inoperable cancers. So given that there is a possibility that these decisions may be reconsidered as a result of uh, drug companies coming forward with lower prices, can he give any indication of what the possible timescales for achieving that objective and having these drugs approved in Scotland might be? Cabinet Secretary. The member raises a very substantial point, uh, Presiding Officer. Let me make two points. First of all, uh, under the reform mechanisms for the SMC that were reformed last year, we are encouraging drug companies to have informal discussions with the SMC before they make a formal application. That would allow them to have a negotiation around issues like cost and price, and hopefully, therefore, when the formal application goes in, the chances of success are substantially enhanced. But the second point is, and one of the reforms we also made, is that where a drug is rejected, there is the opportunity for reasonably rapid resubmission. And as I said earlier, and I've said publicly, I would encourage the manufacturers of these particular drugs to reconsider the issue of price and offer the taxpayer and those uh, who are suffering uh, at the earliest opportunity a better deal so that hopefully these drugs could be approved by the SMC. Uh, I think it's very, very important that we do everything we possibly can to make sure that people uh, suffering from cancer, particularly in a end-of-life type situation, that we do everything we possibly can to ensure that they have the fullest possible access to the drugs that they need to pro prolong their life. I, I was at a meeting in Perth on Friday with a cancer sufferer who has a terminal diagnosis, and I am absolutely of the view that even if a drug extends life by a few months, then we should try as far as possible to make it available because those extra few months with your family and your friends is really matters to the people affected and, of course, to their families. 
Briefly, please, Malcolm Chisholm. The Cabinet Secretary understands the extreme disappointment of breast cancer patients, given that there is a £40 million uh, new medicines fund for orphan and end-of-life uh, medicines. Can, can he tell us whether these drugs were reviewed using the patient and clinical engagement process? And can he also tell us whether he expects the whole of the £40 million to be spent uh, on uh, orphan and end-of-life drugs this year? Cabinet Secretary. Officer, first of all, those drugs were reviewed under the PACE mechanism, but still were turned down by the full SMC uh, for the reasons I've already explained. I should, of course, emphasise that if there is any patient who believes that they would benefit from the drug under the new system of independent uh, application and review, they can still apply uh, through their clinicians and with the support of their clinicians still to get access to this drug. So although there's a general decision made by the SMC in the meantime that this drug is not generally available, uh, people can still access the drug through what used to be called the independent patient uh, treatment and review process. Thank you. Question number eight, Bob Doris. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment is made of the benefits of the project General Practitioners at the Deep End, which has been carried out in deprived communities. Michael Matheson. Uh, President Officer, we welcome the work of the Deep End group of GPs, in particular their recommendations on how we can tackle inequalities in the most deprived areas of Scotland. One of the recommendations was to have linked workers in general practice who would signpost and support patients to sources of support within the community and relieve some of the burden on general practitioners. We have committed to funding this for five years. The Scottish Government, through recognising the challenges in the national GMS contract in relation to practices whose patients face the greatest inequalities have also significantly been altered in the 2015-14-15 uh, GMS contract in order to free up those practitioners uh, to be able to devote, devote more time to the complex problems of their patients. We are working closely with the DPN Group and other NHS organisations to help develop the most appropriate solutions for areas of deprivation. Bob Doris. I thank the Minister for that answer. And I was indeed going to refer to the, the Link Worker uh, project in my supplementary. I visited a project in Postal Park with the Cabinet Secretary in relation to the good work that Link Workers have been doing. You mentioned the programme has been funded for five years. Can I ask? Initially, it was for seven practices in the deep end, 100 most deprived communities. Has that been extended further? What review has there been of the scheme? And can I look forward to more of my constituents and patients across Glasgow region with complex health needs who would most definitely benefit from light workers seeing an enhancement of that service in the years to come? Minister. Um, I, I'm sure the uh, member recognised that during his own visit is the, uh, a key part of what we're doing as part of this programme is the evaluation of the link worker uh, to see how most effective it can actually be used. Initially, the link worker programme was to run for around three years, and because of the discussion that we had with the uh, Deep End practice team, uh, they felt a five-year programme would be much more effective in being able to evaluate its overall benefits. So we have therefore extended it for a further two years. Alongside that uh, provision for a five-year period, we have also, also commissioned Glasgow University to undertake an evaluation programme, which will be undertaken over the initial two to three years of the Link Worker programme. Once we have that initial evaluation, we will then be in a position where we can make a decision about rolling it out to other deep end practices and to also consider what model is the most effective way for the link worker to operate within these deep end practices. So what I can assure the member of is that we are determined to do what we can to help to support these practices working in our most deprived communities and to do so in a way that delivers the most effective change to allow them to improve their patient care and many of whom have very complex health needs. And evaluation work will then inform how we can look at rolling out this programme across more of our deep end practices in Scotland. Question number nine, Annabel Ewing. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what impact the introduction of the mandatory workforce and workload planning tool for nursing has had on the number of nurses in NHS Fife. Cabinet Secretary Alex Neil. Presiding Officer, NHS 5 recently completed their first ever review of the general adult inpatient nursing workforce across all seven NHS sites using the nursing and midwifery workload and workforce planning tools. The review also considered their existing nurses' own professional judgment and local quality outcomes. NHS 5 will, as a result of the review, be increasing their workforce by over 100 registered nurses, and I understand recruitment is currently underway to fill these new posts. 
Annabelle Ewing. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer, but what reassurances can he give that the frontline NHS budget will continue to be protected to ensure that the improvements that are being made by NHS 5 can continue to be delivered? Cabinet Secretary. Standing officer, protecting frontline health services is an absolute priority for this government. And we will do this by increasing the NHS frontline budget despite cuts in the overall budget from Westminster. Scotland's health service will receive in full the Barnet consequentials from increases in health spending down south. In 2015-16, territorial boards will receive allocation increases of 2.7% an increase above forecast inflation, reflecting the importance we attach to protecting our frontline health services. Thank you. Question number 10, Aileen MacLeod. Uh, thank you, presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to help rural NHS boards recruit and retain clinical staff. Cabinet Secretary Alex Neil. A presiding Officer, the Scottish Government remains committed to the delivery of sustainable, high-quality health care in remote and rural areas. While it is the responsibility of NHS boards to recruit staff to ensure they can deliver services, where there are recurring recruitment difficulties, I expect boards to review current service provision, including utilising alternative staffing structures where that would meet the needs of patients. We are supporting boards in this work. For example, I recently announced an additional £40 million of funding for GP and primary care services over the next year, which will help fund local initiatives to improve GP and primary care services where there are particular pressures, such as rural and remote rural and island communities. Aileen McLeod. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response? Having visited the Galloway Community Hospital with me in August, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware of particular concerns regarding the recruitment and retention of a &E staff at the hospital in Stranraer, as well as the concerns that were raised around the lack of training opportunities. So can you tell me what specific measures that he's looking at to assist NHS to Freeze and Galloway in managing that situation? Cabinet Secretary. The presiding officer, I did have a very successful visit to Stranraer, and I can update the member on exactly the point she raises. While it's the, it's the board's responsibility to ensure the correct staffing levels are in place to deliver safe patient care. I have been advised by the board that their medical staffing position has improved and they have recently recruited an additional 2.5 whole-time equivalent doctors. The board has advised this takes a complement to 4.3 whole-time equivalent doctors out of a funded establishment of 6.5. As a consequence, there are no uncovered shifts in the planned rotas up until January 2015. The board continues with recruitment activity. Official ISD statistics showed in Fries and Gallery workforce numbers are up by 5.3% under the SNP. Emergency medicine consultants are up by 307.5% under the SNP, equivalent to 3.1 whole-time equivalent uh, positions. Thank you. Uh, Rhoda Grant, briefly. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, further to the answer the Cabinet Secretary gave to Aileen MacLeod, he stated that the £40 million was additional funding. My understanding is that this has come out of the Integration Fund and therefore is not additional funding. That was a point he made to the Health Committee a couple of weeks ago. Can I hurry you along, please? Uh, given, given the issue covers more than rural areas, indeed urban areas, is it not full time that the Cabinet Secretary took control of this issue and actually give us an NHS that is fit for the 21st Cabinet century? Secretary. Well, of course, one of the big pressures is both in GP surgeries in primary care and in acute services. One of the reasons why there are so many pressures on acute services, not just in rural and remote rural areas and island communities, but throughout Scotland, is because we need to invest more in our primary care services. For example, we do know and we have the evidence to show that many people turn up at accident in emergency departments because they are getting turned around there within four hours instead of having to wait for days or, in some cases, longer for a GP appointment. So that £40 million, which is directed at rural areas, deep end practices, and those practices where there is an above-average ageing population, particularly where there is a very elderly population, which a lot of rural areas have a dis disproportionate share of elderly people, rural areas will benefit enormously from that £40 million. Dennis Robertson. 
Yeah, thank you, Presiding Officer. With the government emphasis on uh, moving patients away from the acute services into primary care, what steps will the government take, Cabinet Secretary, to uh, recruit and retain nurses, health visitors uh, within the rural communities like my own in Aberdeenshire West? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, uh, we take uh, quite a number of initiatives and quite a wide range of initiatives. Uh, and of course, what's very important is to ensure that nurses and indeed allied health professionals have the facilities to work with. So I would argue that the heavy investment we are putting into many areas, if you look at, for example, the Grampian area, the new Inverurie Centre, when it's built in two or three years' time, which I know has the support of the local member, uh, then that's a very good example of how we retain uh, good quality staff in remote, or in that case, just a, a rural area. And, you know, I've been around the Inverurie Centre as it is, and while they do a fantastic job, including some operations, the, the need for a new facility is urgent, which is why we've given the go-ahead and the new facility will be opened in 2017. Questions number 12 and 13 have been withdrawn. I have explanations. I've got to come back to George Adam. No? Yeah. I was getting worried there for a minute, presiding officer. <laughs> to ask the Scottish Government how important local authority care homes are in the provision of care for older people. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, local authority care homes are extremely important in the provision of care for older people. The Scottish Government's Reshaping Care for Older People programme aims to keep people living as independently as possible in a homely setting, including care homes. Local authorities have an important role to play in ensuring there's provision of the right type of care settings in their areas now and in the future. Now I can announce that questions 12 and 13 have been... Supplementary. You are a supplementary. Is it me, presiding officer? <laughs> I got confused because you didn't mention Paisley. <laughs> You'll be glad to know I don't. I thank the CAVSEC for his answer. Can the CAVSEC join me in congratulating the members of my constituency who campaigned to retain Hunter Hill Care Home? Renfrewshire Council tried to close it. This caused understandable outrage among family members, local SNP councils and staff all campaigned to retain the home. Does this not prove that councils like Labour-controlled Renfrewshire Council should consult with uh, members of the public more when they're making decisions like this? Cabinet Secretary. Can I say, Presiding Officer, not only do I agree with the member, but I'm delighted to contribute to his press release, which I'm sure uh, is already en route to the Paisley Daily Express. Uh, can I say it's entirely a matter for local partners to plan provision to meet local needs. However, I would wish to take this opportunity to congratulate all involved in the campaign and their efforts to extend the consultation on the closure of Hunter Hill. They have convinced Renfrewshire Council of the case for keeping the home open, and that will ensure the residents, some of whom have dementia, will be able to remain in their home without the need for a move which might have caused them disruption or extra distress. Can I also say it's extremely important in facing up to the challenge of delayed discharges that we retain and build on the capacity where there is high quality provision in residential homes throughout Scotland. It is an absolutely vital part of our health and social care system. For the third time, can I say that the questions from Game Day and Mary Fear be withdrawn? I do have an explanation. Question 14, Bruce Crawford. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what support it provides for people and their families living with fibrodysplasia, ossificans progressiva, or FOP for short. Minister Michael McMahon. Uh, President Officer, I want to acknowledge the devastating effect on individuals and families of this very rare disease, fibrodysplasia, ossificans progressiva, often called FOP. The Combined Bone Clinic at York Hill Hospital in Glasgow provides support for children with FOP through a multidisciplinary team of specialist physicians, geneticists, occupational therapists and an orthopaedic surgeon. Bruce Crawford. I thank the, uh, the Minister for his answer. Would the Minister agree with me that, that FOP is one of the rarest, most disabling genetic conditions known to medicine? It causes bone to form in muscles, tendons, ligaments and other connective tissue. It progressively restricts 
movement effectively imprisoning a person in the, in the body's own bone. I have a family in my constituency who are a member badly affected by FOP. The family are seeking help through the open market shared equity scheme or any other scheme that might be available to improve the quality of life of their housing. I wonder if the, the, the Minister would agree with me that I can meet with some appropriate official to discuss how best we can take forward their particular needs to satisfy their, their condi the, the condition, not, not help the condition be cured, but make sure their quality of life is a lot more um, improved. Minister. Uh, so officer, the member is, of course, correct in highlighting the very uh, challenging nature of this condition and its progressive nature and how it can increasingly uh, result in someone's mobility uh, being lost. Um, uh, the member is also correct in highlighting the open market shared equity scheme, which is a, a scheme which we have uh, developed for people who are on low to uh, medium incomes to be able to access house ownership. And it has a particular priority for uh, those who have uh, a disability, are social renters or are members of the armed forces, including uh, veterans. I would, of course, be more than happy to make sure that the member is able to meet with a group of our officials who can assist him in considering his own constituents' case to see what assistance can be provided to them. Thank you. That ends portfolio questions. The next item of business is consideration of business motion number 11581 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick.